going in my Bible to John chapter 20. If you'll go in your Bible there too, John chapter 20. I'm going to read a good bit of the latter part of this chapter, but really we won't wander far from this place all morning. So if you just go there in your Bible, we'll really use this as the text from which we'll work today. So I'm in John 20. Let's begin in verse 19 where the text says, So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And he said to them this, he, and when he had said to them this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Now, watch verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to them, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand to his, into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here with your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Before we talk about that text, I want you to think about this picture. I'm pushing the button. There's my picture. I looked at that picture a lot three or four years ago. It was the theme slide for our church family for the entire year. In fact, that was our theme verse. And so every slide presentation, every Sunday morning, started with that slide and that verse. And if we happen to be preaching from the theme that morning, We saw it several times, so I spent a lot of time doing what you're doing this morning, staring at that slide. I want you to look with me at that picture for you for the first time. What do you see? What in the picture captures your eye? Maybe for some of you, your eyes are immediately drawn all the way to that top of that lighthouse and you see, you see that light sort of beaming off into the distance. The lighthouse is serving its purpose. It's shining the light through the storms so the ships will know, don't come this way, there are rocks here, right? And it makes me think about, it makes me think about Jesus' words in Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount. After describing who we are with the Beatitudes, he says of disciples, We are the light of the world. Christians are shining as a bright light in a dark world, helping people find Jesus. Maybe you see the light. Or maybe you're thinking, David, that's not where I looked at all. My eyes eyes immediately went to the bottom of that picture, and I'm looking at that big foundation on which the lighthouse is constructed. One of our elders did a masterful job explaining how they construct lighthouse foundations. You're thinking, could anything be more boring? It was really interesting, though, because you think about the conditions in which 
that thing's got to be built. And, and then the foundation of a lighthouse has to be rock solid, right? Because it's going to take a beating. And it occurred to me that our faith has to be that way. Because of something else that's in the picture. Maybe, maybe your eyes were taken in by the waves pounding against the base of that foundation. That's why it's got to be solid. Because a lighthouse foundation is going to take a beating from the sea. And it occurs to me that our faith needs to be rock solid because it is going to be pounded by the storms too. Brothers and sisters, storms are coming that threaten to upset our faith and destabilize us spiritually. And so in preparation for those storms, we need a faith that is rock solid. I wanted to begin there because I can't think of anything that could be more destabilizing to a person's faith than to have doubts about what we believe, doubts about the basic things we believe, and to not really know what to do about them. And I've got to tell you, I think that's where a lot of disciples, let me emphasize, I think especially a lot of young disciples find themselves riddled with doubts and uncertainties, even about the very basic things Christians believe, and they're not really sure what to do about them. I'm going to tell you something, folks. That is a dangerous thing in this day and age because we are living at a time, I think more so than any other time in the history of this nation, where more is happening to make people question even the basic things they believe as a Christian, like the notion that there is a God and that the Bible is the Word of God and Jesus was the Savior that came to rescue us and in the end there is heaven, there is hell. More is being done. It's on television. They hear it in the classroom at school. When they go off to college, it's all over YouTube and the Internet. Things that make us less certain, that make us question what we believe. And as a result of that, a lot of young people are growing up with doubts. And sometimes it isn't just young people, and they aren't sure what to do about it. We need to be anticipating the storm, because it's coming. And so I want to talk to you for a little while this morning about what we do with our doubts. So that we can be prepared when this storm afflicts us. I've got four things you want to, I want you to think about with me this morning. This stage is really high. You know, at home, I kind of get up to the edge and hang my toes off, and I did that this morning and thought, I could fall. And it's a long way down. I'm going to stay back a little bit today and ask you to think with me about what we do with our doubts. Four things I want you to consider. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about our attitude. I think we need to think about how we think about our doubts. Did that make sense or was that a confusing sentence? I think we need to think about how we think about our doubts. And there are two things I would mention in that context this morning. The first thing I think we know as we think about our doubts is that everybody's going to have them. Everybody is going to have them. We may not struggle with the same thing. And our doubts may not run as deep as somebody else's doubts run, but I promise you, everybody, everybody at some point and in some way is going to wrestle with doubts. For a lot of people, it's when you get away from home the first time. Some of you go through that? I packed up and moved a thousand miles away from home to go to college after I graduated. And people go off to college and for the very first time, they have to start owning their faith. Because you wake up on Sunday morning, this will freak out mom and dad. You wake up on Sunday morning and you think, I don't have to go today. I'm a thousand miles from home, and this was before Facebook. My mom and dad aren't going to know whether I go or not. And so we have to start deciding if we believe all this stuff because we really believe it, or have we just been tagging along with mom and dad? And so first of all, there's this process of sort of embracing your own faith and deciding... 
I think this is true. But often that is done in a context where kids are sur surrounded by a bunch of guys with PhDs who are raising questions about what they've always believed and a bunch of kids who are living lives of moral relativism. Doesn't really matter what you do, doesn't matter how you behave, and all kinds of ungodly temptations going on all around them. So it's a really tough environment to be making that decision. And so young people are wrestling as they go off to school with whether or not they really believe. And there's a lot in that setting to make them wonder and to make them doubt. And if not when we're off at school, maybe it'll come a little later. Maybe it'll come when you're having a co uh, lunch with a co-worker and talking about spiritual things because you're trying to talk to your friends about Jesus and he shows you a verse you didn't know was in the Bible. Or he asks you a question you don't know how to answer. Or he defends something that you always thought was wrong and he makes a pretty reasonable argument and you're beginning to wonder, what else do I not know? What other verses have I not read? Maybe what I believe isn't true and you go through a season of doubt. Or maybe it'll come later when your mother gets cancer and she lingers with it and suffers before she dies and there's that moment where you wonder she was a faithful servant of God how could he let her linger and suffer with this terrible disease and you you go through a season of doubt everybody does in fact it shouldn't surprise us even Jesus own disciples went through doubt the text we read in John 20 are you still open there who's going through doubt here it's one of the 12. It's Thomas. Have you ever thought about what preceded this moment in John 20? What Thomas had seen? He wasn't some fringe guy in the Bible story. He's one of the apostles. He has been with Jesus all the way through. He's heard the teaching. He's heard the claims. He has seen the miracles. He was there at the gate of the village Nain when they're bringing out the dead guy for the funeral procession. And his group is coming in. He saw Jesus raise the guy from the dead. He witnessed it. He had heard the claims. I'm going to die again. I'm going to die and be raised again on the third day. And Thomas had an advantage none of the other apostles had. He had eyewitness testimony from guys he knew to be reliable sources, from the other apostles who come to him and say, we've seen the Lord. Did you see that? In John 20? And yet still he doubts and he's not willing to believe it. But I have to tell you, that's not my most impressive case of doubt. If, if, if you look over at Matthew 14, there is that incident in Matthew 14 where Jesus comes to his disciples walking on the water. Do you remember that story? It's the me too story because Peter says, Peter says me too, right? Lord, let me come to you. And Jesus says, come on. And Peter steps up and he gets out of the boat. Let me tell you something. If there is a moment to have doubt, that was it, right? It's getting out of the boat. And Peter's way past that. He's out of the boat and he's walking on the water and he sees what? The waves. And he begins to doubt. And he starts to sink. And that just baffles me. Why at that moment, Peter? You're already doing it. And still he doubted. And so, if Thomas doubted, with all of his advantages, and Peter doubted at this amazing moment, should it really surprise us that we're going to go through periods of doubt too. That's the first thing we need to understand if we're going to think about this in the right way. Everybody does, even the apostles. The second thing that I think is really important if we're going to process our doubts in the right way is to recognize we're not bad if we have doubts. Can I emphasize that? We are not bad if we have doubts. Now that probably deserves some modification because I have seen some people whose doubts I think were, were moved by, by bad motives. For example, we had a guy years ago who was a drunk. And about the third time he fell off the wagon, one of the elders met with him and said, guys, we've got to get this fixed. You've got a young family. You've got to get off this alcohol. Me and you, we're going to start going to AA meetings together, and we're going to get this straight. We're going to get you off alcohol. And the next week I met with the guy, and he said, I don't believe in God anymore. I got to tell you something, folks, that doubt was not about doubt. That doubt was about AA. He didn't want to get off the alcohol, okay? 
But I don't think that's where doubt comes from for most people. I've encountered some very sincere, thoughtful folks who really wanted to believe, but they were just struggling, like Ken. Ken was a guy that I studied with years ago. Like me, he grew up believing a lot of the same basic things, that there is a God, and the Bible is the Word of God. And he said he went off to the university, and he sat in some biology classes where he was presented with the, the mountain of evidence for evolution. You've heard about that before? There is this mountain of evidence for evolution, he was told, and the teacher just piled it on and built the mountain. And he said, you know, I doubted. He said, when we met for the first time, Look, David, I want to believe in God. I want the Bible to be true, but I am not willing to check my brain at the door of the church building. That process of being confronted with uncertainty and questions about what you believe, and then as a result of that, struggling with, with some doubts and having to work through that and figure that out. That is not a bad thing, folks. In fact, at the end of that process, if it's the right process, it could be a healthy thing that actually makes our faith stronger. We don't ever just want to accept something because it is what we have always believed. And so I want to say emphatically this morning, it doesn't make you a bad person because you are struggling with doubts. I especially want to say that to young people. If you have questions about what, what is taught here, if you've got questions about what mom and dad have always said, it is okay to talk about that. No question you have is off limits, even if you're in that place that some people find themselves where you're not sure there is a God. Can I tell you something about the people in this church family? They do not want you to keep quiet about that. They want to know about that. It's okay for you to ask that question. How do we know there is a God? Why don't we have a band? Church would be way more fun if we had a band up there. Those are appropriate questions for you to ask. We want you to. In fact, I even wonder about Thomas. We call him the doubter, and we do that to kind of put a negative label on him. And I would concur. He had every reason to believe. But do you notice here in John 20 that the Lord doesn't really fuss at him? I mean, if he does rebuke him here, it is a mild rebuke. But what Jesus does not do is say, look, bud, you had all these advantages. If you can't believe after all you've heard and all you've seen, we don't need you anymore, right? He didn't say that. What does Jesus do? Jesus takes steps to help Thomas believe. And brothers and sisters, that's what he wants to do for me and you too. When we're going through a season of doubt, Jesus wants to help us believe. Which brings me to my second point this morning. Once we get our attitude straight about this, we're also going to figure out how we're going to process these doubts. What do we do about them? I think already we've said there are some things that you do not want to do. Can I just go back and emphasize that again? You don't want to keep quiet about your doubt because they're not going to go away. It's sort of like ignoring the warning signs that you've got termites in your house. If you'll just not pay attention, that problem just goes away, doesn't it? No. What happens is a storm comes and your house falls down because it couldn't hold up. You don't want to ignore your doubts. You're not going to go away. But let me talk about an opposite extreme I think people go to. Some people, some people are too quick to give up their faith. Some people encounter a YouTube video or a college professor who throws some stuff their way that they have never thought about before. And all of a sudden they decide, well, I've never thought about that before. Or that's a question I can't answer. And so what I believe must not be true. And they're just too quickly, quick to abandon their faith. That's not the answer either. Let me, let me be clear about something. Just because you don't know the answer to some question does not mean there isn't one. And just because your mom and daddy don't know the answer to a question doesn't mean there isn't a good answer to the question. In fact, can it be kind of harsh? Even if the preacher and the elders where you're going to church don't have an answer, that doesn't mean there isn't an answer. And so when we encounter these doubts, we're going to have to learn something about process, how we process our doubts. And so I think the text here in John 20 helps us with that. Are you still open there? If you look down to verse 27, we have that second meeting recorded here, there, here where, where, where Thomas is now present. And the Lord specifically addresses him. Did you notice what he said? He said, reach here with your finger. 
and see my hands and reach her with your hand and put it into my side. You see what Jesus tells Thomas to do? He said, I want you to con conduct an investigation. I want you to examine the evidence. When we're dealing with doubt, folks, that's what we're supposed to do. We need to conduct an investigation. We need to examine the evidence. You know, I think there's some people who are afraid to do that. I think there are some disciples who are afraid to dig into their questions and carefully examine the evidence. I think they're afraid of how that will come out. You know, sometimes people raise questions about how the Bible has been transmitted down to us and maybe things were changed or maybe things were lost. Sometimes PBS will have a show about, about the lost books of the Bible or something like that. And I think that scares some people. They think, look, if I, if I dig into this, I may find out something I don't want to know. I may find out that what I believe is not true. And so they just don't look. Can I be clear about something, folks? That is not who we are. We are not guardians of the traditions. We are truth seekers. We want to know what's right. To the point that we put it all on the line, everything we believe, and subject it to the evidence. The Lord was willing to do that. Back up a little bit. I told you we wouldn't go far from John 20, so I'm just going to John 10. Will you look there in your Bible? And I'm down in verse 37. John 10, verse 37. <clears throat> so Jesus says to his enemies, If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. Was he willing to put it all on the line? He was making supernatural claims. He needed to be able to back that up with evidence. And frankly, what the Lord says, if I can't do that, if I'm running around claiming to be God and I can't provide evidence for that claim, don't believe me. You see that? But he continues, verse 38, but if I do them, that is, if I do the works of my Father, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. He said, listen, if I do supply the evidence, even if you are personally kind of hung up with me, you need to look at the evidence. And you need to follow what it says because it's going to lead you to the truth. That's who we are. We do not guard traditions. We seek to know truth. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. The only thing that has to fear investigation is error. The closer you look and examine, truth always rises to the top. And so I say again, especially to our young people, don't blindly accept that what you've always been taught is true. That is not a faith that will survive the storm. It won't survive your first college biology professor. Conduct an investigation. Carefully weigh the evidence that support what you believe. Don't ever be afraid to ask the tough questions and to dig deeply and thoroughly explore what you believe. Listen, folks, don't be freaked out by that. The evidence is on our side. We're not afraid to look. Now, I do need to add something to this investigation. We need to conduct a fair investigation. For example, you may go off to college and your biology professor hands you this big, thick textbook that he wrote, that $200 textbook that he wrote that's required reading for your biology class, that, that, that builds this mountain of evidence for evolution. What do you need to do with that book? Read it. I think we need our kids to read and examine carefully the theory of evolution. In fact, folks, I think if they just work the theory and look at it and its evidence, the theory takes care of itself. It falls apart. The better they understand the theory, the better they can cope with it. Read the book. Read the professor's biology book. Read the book that defends evolution. Just make sure it's not the only book that you read. 
You should also read maybe Stephen J. Meyer's book, Signature in the Cell, or Michael Bay's book, Darwin's Black Box, that considers all that evidence from the other side. People get online. Young people get online and they look at YouTube videos from atheists like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and they hear questions raised and that's all they listen to. Well, just listen to one side of that. Some other guys on that online that, that, that answer those arguments, you should listen to those too. Here's my frustration. What's happening to some of our young people is they're only getting one part of the story. In fact, do you realize that folks on the other side are conspiring to make sure that that happens? In the public school, they don't even want kids to know there is a Bible, much less consider an alternative view of the information that they're presenting. It's kind of like going to the car dealer and he hands you a contract, says don't bother to read it, just sign at the bottom. I wonder what they're hiding. Why are they so worried about kids seeing all of this from a Bible perspective? What did they have to hide? What are they afraid of? You need to be sure they don't keep any of that from you. That you consider both sides and you weigh the evidence. To stop believing just because you got hit with a question you don't you know how to answer is bad process. Everybody experiences doubt, but sometimes those doubts lead to bad outcomes because we don't process them in the right way. What is needed is an investigation. We need to weigh the evidence to heal both sides. And then once you've done that, that brings us to a third thing. Once you've done that, that's going to carry with it a responsibility. Do you see that in John chapter 20? Will you look back there with me? Because in verse 27, you'll notice that he doesn't just tell Thomas to conduct the investigation. He says at the end of verse 27, And do not be unbelieving but believing. Do you see that? After Thomas weighs the evidence, what Jesus says is, you've got to draw a conclusion. You've got to decide, after you've looked at the evidence, what you believe, and so do we. After we examine the evidence, we have to make a call. We have to decide. Now, I'll tell you what's interesting here in John 20. You do realize that even as Thomas is called to make a decision. There's a lot he doesn't know about Jesus. You ever thought about that? Thomas doesn't yet understand what the resurrection was all about. The gospel has yet to be preached. That's going to be Acts 2. Why did Jesus come? Why did he die? What was that all about? What was it going to accomplish? That at this point is still a mystery. I tell you what Thomas knows. <clears throat> Jesus claimed to be God. And Thomas saw him die. And now Thomas is looking at him alive. And because of that evidence, he's able to reach a conclusion. If he said he was God and he died and rose, well, you see it, right? Verse 28, what does he confess? My Lord and my God. Those claims certainly were true. Well, he still had a lot to learn. There's a lot of blanks that had to be filled in there, but this he knew. Jesus was God as he had claimed to be. I will tell you over the years that I have found that there are basically two kinds of people in the world. There are people with questions and people with answers, and everybody, people who are looking for questions, people who are looking for answers, and everybody finds what they're looking for. You and I just have to kind of decide what kind of person that we're going to be. Someone who's looking for questions or someone who's looking for answers. Because I promise you, there will always be questions. Always. Can I illustrate that for you? Take this great debate over, over creation and evolution. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I don't have all the answers on that. I don't have all the answers because I don't know what all the questions are. As I continue to study that, I encounter new questions I have to think about all the time and will for the rest of my life. And when we get done with those questions, they will have come up with some new ones by then, right? There will always be questions. But that doesn't prevent me from deciding what I believe based on what I know now. Do you see that? Just like Thomas. Do you know what I know now? I live in a world 
that is full of amazingly designed things, like me. Uh, I've thought over the last few years a lot about DNA, this amazing coding system that's in the cells of all of us that in essence makes us who we are. The billions of pieces of information that are in our DNA that make us who we are. And I will tell you, folks, as I've considered that evidence, I've reached a conclusion. The atheist argument that, well, first there was nothing and out of nothing came something and then nature worked on that and made DNA, that is unreasonable to me. That defies all common sense and logic. That doesn't work. I tell you what it does say to me. You look at DNA, you know somebody really brilliant and powerful had to make that exist. It says to me that there's a God. Has to be. No other adequate explanation for the design that we see around us. That's what I believe. Does that answer all the questions? No. There are more questions that come up all the time. And when I encounter one in my study, I do the same thing. I put my faith on the table. I take the evidence and I research and I study and I go wherever the evidence leads. I believe what is true. And over the years, what I've found is over and over again, if I'll just be careful about my process and look at both sides of it over and over again, what I believe as a disciple just is confirmed to be true again and again and again. But you and I have to reach a decision. We've got to decide. And what the Lord said is that everything is hanging on that decisions. Can I just close there? If you look back to John 20, verses 30 and 31, what you're going to find is that Jesus says everything is riding on this decision. He tells us that there were many other signs that Jesus performed that are not written in this book. But why were these written? Do you notice what he says there? These are written that you might believe. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So first of all, folks, there is enough evidence here to produce belief. Jesus said it. That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have what? Do you see it? That you may have life. That's what's at stake here. What we decide about this has huge implications. This is not just some trivial philosophical debate left for college professors in some teacher's lounge off in a university somewhere. This is about me and you having life, real life now and life eternally with God when it's over. The decision we make is critical. And so maybe somebody sitting in this crowd already has looked at the evidence and you already know that there is evidence sufficient to prove Jesus was who he claimed to be. He is the Savior. And you need to embrace that. You need to confess your belief in that. And you need to obey his command to be baptized for the remission of your sins. If that's where you are, we want you to act on what you believe. Make a decision today. Become his child. Make your way down front while we stand, while we sing.